Well, thank you so much for having Savvy Ladies and Vanessa here with um, the Silicon Valley chapter today, this morning. So good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here as um, I am Judy Herbst, the Executive Director of Savvy Ladies. And I just want to share a little bit about what Savvy Ladies is. We are a nonprofit that um, champions financial education. We empower women to take control of their finances through education. And we do that through um, a helpline where we match women with any of their questions, financial questions, no matter what their um, income level might be, everyone has a financial question with a community of financial advisors. So we call that our helpline and we will be celebrating our 20th year as we go into 2023, which is quite amazing. This year alone, we have really um, ex extended our outreach. And I think this is because of women searching for financial advice, they're seeking out knowledge and we have now connected over 1,500 women on our free financial helpline um, year to date this year. So that is phenomenal. And with that, we've grown our, our, our financial professional community with now over 160 um, professional advisors offering their pro bono services. Um, Vanessa is one of our greatest um, advocates and supporters and educators. And it is really a pleasure that um, the Silicon Valley reached out to Savvy Ladies and Vanessa as one of our um, supporters and volunteers has um, is able to present to you today. It really is a delight for me to introduce her. I love that her mantra is empowering women to unlock their fullest potential through personal well-being and financial wellness. This is spot on with Savvy Ladies. That's why it, it's it's been such a lovely, lovely partnership working with her. Um, just she spent her her career growing and working about family um, financial management, and she'll take you through that in today. She has spent years at the Hightower Group um, working with those advisors. She's authored an amazing book called um, Around Family Value at Risk, which I do highly recommend. Um, I'm sure she'll share a link with you. And as I said, she is a strong supporter of Savvy Ladies. So while I will turn it over to our Savvy speaker, Vanessa, to share with you, please know that the Savvy Ladies Helpline is a free resource that is open to all people to come and, and seek out and get answers and get matched with a financial advisor. So thank you very much, Silicon Valley Chapter. And Vanessa, I turn it back over to you now to start. Perfect. <clears throat> thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. And I know that when we typically talk about investments, finance, that's the key term that comes to mind. And today I want to share a little more than just the investments, right? I want to talk a little bit about what I define as true wealth, right? As you can be in different stages of your life, creating wealth, right? Uh, conserving it and conveying it. So it depends on what stage you're at, but I still believe regardless of the stage you're in today, understanding all of the pieces is very helpful to know where what phase you're in and if you need to look back at something in the past or forward. So starting off, true wealth. Personally, I think it's both the tangible and non-tangible pieces. Too many times we focus on just what is an investment and the stock market or real estate right? That's what we believe it is. And, and that's all we talk about. But the truth is that our values, our beliefs, our goals, tying those two pieces together with just the investment piece um, is what can bring that true wealth. And I'm going to walk through a few uh, steps on creating it, right? And the first piece is definitely building that relationship with wealth. So I want everyone right now to like take a moment and sit. What is, what does that mean to you, right? What is your relationship with wealth today? Is it something scary that you don't like to talk about? Is it something overwhelming? Um, do you enjoy it? And are you just have like five spreadsheets on everything that you do and how you do it and you have your budget and you have your net worth, right? 
And the reason I want you to think this through is because that's truly what defines the actions you take. Understanding what your relationship is with money is what drives those results in the future, right? It'll drive the decisions you make plus the results that will happen because of those decisions. So this is part of wealth. This is part of the investment process. So let's make sure that we analyze that and not just think through, okay, what do I need to do, Vanessa, right? That's the question people love to ask. What do I do now? Well, I also want you to understand why. Why are you doing that, right? So let's make sure we take a moment to do that. Okay, now this is the piece that's really important, right? If you tie those values that you just went over in your mind and you wrote down you and your spouse, if you're single with yourself, if you have a partner, with your partner, and what are the values, right? Integrity, I want to make sure that whatever we do for our family follows these values. I put a couple on here to the left, honesty, loyalty. So if those are your values, how are you making sure that then on the right side, you have your goals, are these aligned? Are those values that you've set with your partner designed to integrate with your goals, right? So these are, it's more of driving these questions and giving yourself those answers, right? Not, not Don't just skip through it, right? Let's make sure we sit in these questions and truly answer or develop them, right? When I've sat with some families, they're like, well, I never thought about that. Of course, because sometimes you're just you're just so used to sitting with an advisor and them showing you multiple charts and just talking about, oh, the Fed's decision to raise rates and inflation's at all time high. And of course, those pieces tie together to what allocations we're going to build on a portfolio. But having your values in place and on that paper, just as much as you have the numbers is just as important, if not more so. Okay, so we're still in the creation phase, right? So for those of you that are listening that one of two pieces, either you're in the younger stage and you're creating wealth, or you've just never had anyone talk to you about wealth planning. So you're in the phase still, regardless of age, in creating. Typically when people talk about budgets, right? we all get a little scared of, do I have to stop doing that, Vanessa? Is, is a budget truly just telling me, no, 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 no. It's not. It's not if you build it and you're able to align it towards what you want, right? So it's not about stop doing this. It's how much of that can I actually do? And when can I do it? Making sure that I'm aligning my budget to reach my goals. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm tr I want, I'd like it to be a little dynamic. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to type them in and share, share your thoughts. But it's thinking through like how many of us actually have a budget and stick to it, right? We all like to build the budget. Well, personally, <laughs> I'm a spreadsheet person, so I like building budgets, but there needs to be a path, right? One of a typical rule is the 50, 30, 20 rule that 50% of the income needs has to go for your needs, 30% for your wants and 20% for savings. So right now, everybody do like a quick math. How much do you make? What's your income? And are you taking 20% of that income and saving or investing it? If you're not, what adjustments can you make to be able to reach those pieces? And sometimes one of the biggest pieces where you see that you need to make adjustments are in the wants, right? So if you go over here in this wants bucket, are there pieces there that you can adjust? So take your time, go through this, but follow through with it. 
and understand that a budget isn't set in stone, right? Just like your trust documents aren't set in stone. You create them to kind of build a path. But what happens? Life, life happens, right? We have life and we have children, we have marriages, we have divorces, we have death in the family. So all of these pieces are life and we need to adjust. So make sure that a budget is truly a tool that has flexibility, but you need to make sure that there's still an end goal that isn't necessarily completely changing, right? You want some type of end goal and then you can adjust the budget along the way, but still making sure that we're able to reach that. Okay, now on this one, there should be questions. <laughs> um, but retirement accounts, there's a lot of retirement accounts. So that means there's multiple ways that we can all save for our future, right? We don't want to be that burden on our family as much as we don't want our family to be a burden on us. So I always think of up a generation and down a generation. The standard is, okay, I'm the mother, so I have to protect my children, but what we've seen happen is the lifespan has extended. So maybe I need to take care of my mom, right? If I need to take care of my parents or my in-laws, how is my budget okay to do so in those directions, right? Or how can I help my parents or my in-laws prepare so that way there's less of a burden on me in the future, right? So some of those accounts, for those of you on is, are, do you work with a company that offers a 401k? Are you invested in it? Traditionally, the 401k is only offered pre-tax dollars. The majority of companies, not all yet, but the majority of companies now offer the Roth component in your 401k. That means post-tax dollars. Of course, it depends, right? This is where you need to sit with someone that analyzes all your pieces to be able to say, I recommend that you switch, right? If you were in traditional because you've been working for the company for 10 or 15 years and now they've added this new option, do I switch over to that option? Well, it depends. We need to oh, you know, take a look at what your income is, what your future income will be, and what that tax bracket will be. But everyone on the call, you should know if the company offers it or not. So if there's homework, which I love homework, so I will be assigning some for all of you, is go to your website, the company website on the uh, retirement options, check your 401k and see if there's the option for you to invest instead of the traditional way, which is pre-tax if you have post-tax, right? So that's the 401k. So that's the third line item here that we were talking about. Typically, it's pre-tax, right? Typically, because this is, but there is post now. And that's the difference of, and oh, also knowing if you have your 401k, you can also invest in an IRA, either traditional or Roth. So those are the pieces where people sometimes ask me, well, Vanessa, I'm fully contributing my maximum amount to my 401k, which as of 2022 is 20,500. If you're over 50, it's 27,000, right? So you're like, I'm done. I'm, I'm investing as much as I can in that bucket. Correct. But there's other buckets, right? You can, inv you can invest either 6,000 under 50 or 7,000 over 50 in a Roth or a traditional IRA on top of your 401k. So now you have both of those vehicles. Some of you actually might have an opportunity of investing in an HSA, right? So if you are paying into a high deductible plan for health benefits, you can have uh, another vehicle that is pre-tax. This, the HSA is the most wonderful plan that exists because it's pre-tax dollars, but then the end result is kind of like a Roth. The gain isn't taxed and it's not taxed on the way out. So it's the like the best of all worlds. And some people 
have the idea that the HSA, I get it, Vanessa, but I have to use that for health benefits only. That's true, except when you turn 65. After you turn 65, you can withdraw from your HSA for anything you'd like. So these are like tips and tricks of different retirement accounts that maybe you're not taking advantage of because you have a preconceived idea that it can only work a certain way. So an HSA is a great account if you have the opportunity to invest in one. And then, of course, just what they're called is taxable retirement accounts. That just means your dollars, you put them in an account, either in joint name, in trust name, and those just grow year after year, and there is no limits, right? So that's a basic account that you have. Is there any questions here? We have one question, uh, Roth conversion recommendations. Yes, I, I guess that. that this is a question is should one do it or not do it? Roth conversions recommendations. So I personally <laughs> love the Roth option because you have the gains that grow, you know, tax free basically. And then as long as you hold a Roth for over five years and you're over the age of 59 and a half, then you don't have penalties. So Roth conversion, for those of you listening, is you have a traditional IRA and you'd like to take some or all of those funds and convert it to a Roth, in that conversion, you must still pay the taxes. Once it's in a traditional IRA, to pull it out, you will pay taxes on it, right? There's federal and state. So do I recommend? Maybe. It depends on what's happening in your life at the moment. So when would I recommend it? I would recommend it if, you are in the lowest tra tax bracket you'll ever be, right? So let's say you stopped working and decided you're not going to work anymore and income in general, wherever it flows from to you will be the lowest it'll possibly ever be. And you are in that very low tax bracket. That could be a good time to do so because whatever comes out of that, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> traditional IRA, can then turn into your Roth. So that's a huge advantage for you. And later on in a few other slides, I will talk about allocation of dollars, right? People worry about the asset allocation and there's also a, you should worry about your asset location. And what that means is where are your dollars, right? You can have $3 million, but if they're all in traditional, in a traditional IRA, then come the RMDs. So if it's $3 million in there, do you really have $3 million? No, you have to pay taxes, right? That's where it becomes a little tricky to do the math. How can you apply for HSA? So anyone can apply for HSA as long as you are paying into a high deductible plan. I guess the only other question is one just above the one you just uh, uh, answered. Four hundred one k Roths have RMD, but not Roth IRAs. Uh, that's required minimum withdrawals. Okay, so your four hundred one k, if you're still working and you're over the age of seventy two, you just need to make sure that in that plan, because remember, in the past. So if you're age 72, that means you've been in the transition between traditional and non, non, so pre and post tax in your 401k. So we would just have to kind of look through it and see what those are. So because they're commingled into your 401k, that's maybe why someone is telling you that you have to take that RMD. But if you're over the age, you can pull the Roth out of the 401k and put it into a Roth. So that way you don't have to take that RMD. Oh. Okay. Um, if there's not another one on the, if I have a medical plan from cashier, can I apply for HSA? So as long as it's high deductible. So you just have to check like, how much are you paying? It, it'll give you, it's typically like if you have a deductible over a thousand dollars, 
but it should. So if you go to your company website, it will give you the option typically, right? You scroll down and if it doesn't let you, if you didn't apply for the insurance and you're not paying, you're not in a high deductible plan, it won't even allow you to click on the HSA <clears throat> option. So we'd have to look at your, at whatever medical plan is offered by your company. As long as it's a high deductible though, yes, you're allowed to open an HSA. And it adds up. It adds up that 3,650. But you don't have to use the contributions to pay your medical expenses, correct? You don't have to. No, you can let it keep rolling, adding up for yourself, which is great. If you have the funds outside of what you're putting into the HSA, <clears throat> then don't use it. You're letting it continuously grow. So that's wonderful. And I think you should be good, Mary, to be able to uh, open that HSA there. Okay, investing. So some people think through, oh, I'm saving money, so I'm fine, right? I opened an account and I'm saving dollars, which, which is part of the process, but then you need to make sure that after you've covered yourself, for emergency expenses, any additional funds that you continuously save, you're investing those dollars. Because then comes this second piece right here, the compound interest, right? So what you want is something to grow faster for you. That's the purpose of investing because it's interest paid on interest, right? So a savings account, like they pay you 2% a year, it's 2%, you have $1,000, you get paid 2%. Compounding interest is kind of what a gentle way that you could talk about investing, right? You're putting the dollars in and obviously there's ups and downs in the market, but there's definitely more growth there, which will take you to a place to meet those goals that you have for yourself financially. And diversification. So this is the piece that many, many, many get confused with. Oh, I'm diversified because I have three advisors, right? I have my dollars over here at Vanguard. I have my dollars over here at Fidelity and I have my dollars over here with my other advisor, right? So I have three advisors, I'm fully diversified. Now, is that true? <laughs> probably not. This is why, I'll tell you why you're probably not invested because every advisor is going to want what's best for their client. They should want what's best for their client. So if I'm sitting with you and the market is doing well as it did last year, right? Last year was a phenomenal year in the market. So I'm gonna be growth oriented for you, obviously dependent on what your goals are. So is the other advisor. And then so is the other advisor, which means if he's holding Apple, she's holding Apple and I'm holding Apple for you, you are not diversified in your holdings. You're diversified in the sense that you're talking to three different people, that's your diversification, but not in your assets, not in your allocations. And I think sometimes advisors, uh, because of the past, have a bad name that everyone's reluctant on sharing information and over communicating, but this is the issue. If you go to the doctor and you're like, doc, I have a cough, that's what I have. That's my symptom, that's all I have. And the doctor asks you, have you been going to the bathroom regularly? You're like, wait, what does going to the bathroom have to do with my cough, right? Do we really question the doctor constantly on why are you asking about my shoulders? Why are you asking me about hair loss? Why are you, because they need to know everything to be able to diagnose. It's the same for an advisor, right? You'd need to know all aspects of everything that's going on so that way I'm able to say, oh, okay, then if you're already invested, let's say growth-minded over here, maybe we'll be more value over here, right? So you need to see the full picture. It doesn't mean you need to put all your money with one advisor, but one of your advisors at least should be able to see your full picture because you need to see your full picture. And it's helpful to have someone that kind of organizes those pieces for you, 
right? So that's the diversification piece. Then we talk about asset allocation and asset location, which is what I was talking about on the slide before. Allocation is just deciding what you wanna be invested in, the what. Location is the where, right? Because if you are only invested, let's say you never put money away in retirement accounts. You always just had, you know, you got paid and you'd put it in a trust account, in a joint account. Those are called taxable accounts. That's, that's the only account you have. That means you're not, you had no deferral throughout your whole life. You have nothing that's put away that will help you from those gains throughout the year. So this is why everybody recommends making sure that you have money in a 401k, money in a traditional IRA, money in a Roth IRA. That is the true diversification of where the dollars are head, held. Sorry, Are two or more brokers a good idea? So it depends. Are they talking to each other? Are you fully comfortable um, with what your allocations are? Right. So you have to have that knowledge. If you want to have two brokers, you can, right? But are you aware of what each of them are doing? Are you okay with this one being like if your overall portfolio, I'm sure we've heard the 60-40 rule or the 70-30 rule, right? These rules, what they mean is 60% of your portfolio is more geared towards equities, right? Stocks. And then 40% is more of a conservative idea of let's say bonds, right? So 60% stocks, 40% bonds. This is what you have with advisor A because advisor A has told you that that's, that's the rules that he lives by, right? And he believes that those are best for you. Advisor B tells you, no, I don't believe in that. I believe in the 80-20 rule. 80% should be equities and 20% should be bonds. So now they're investing that way. And then you believe you should be 50-50. <laughs> so all of these numbers all over the place, which means your allocations are the same, right? The same means all over the place. This is why having two brokers, you have to be in charge then. You have to be in charge of building this spreadsheet that says this broker is investing in these things, this broker is investing in these things, and they make sense together. So if you're willing to do that, then yeah, it's okay. It's all about preference, right? Who do you feel comfortable with? Who do you trust? Who do you know is doing what's right for you and your family? That's how I pick advisors, right? And advisors could be your attorney, your accountant, right? All of these people need to be intertwined together because your accountant could be telling you, oh yes, you know, you should open that traditional IRA, you should open, right, because there's limits. Remember that too, right? Depending on your income level, there's certain um, retirement accounts that you can't invest in. Obviously there's always loopholes around it, but these are just rules that you need to know. So if your CPA tells you one thing, but your attorney tells you another, and then your financial advisor tells you another, you're the one who has to sit there and organize all these thoughts. That's why I believe in more of a comprehensive plan where you have someone who's in charge and can help you through this process. Okay, now we're in another phase, right? Now we've gone through building the budget, creating it, understanding it, the places that you can put everything. Now we're going to move into, how do I take care of this? How do I take care of all my money? I worked so hard, what do I do? Well, planning time. Financial planning, retirement planning, and estate planning. A financial plan, uh, the next slide, I'll show kind of the different phases that are in this plan, but it's kind of like a budget with yeah. way more details, right? We so, tie so into it, it any other income that you might have, social security that you might receive in the future, a pension that you might receive. So it ties all of these pieces and can give you this outlook and runs different models saying, if X and Y happen, then this and this, right? So it gives you options. It could say plan A will give you this, plan B will give you this, 
and then you pick what's best. So it's nice. It's a, it's a great tool to have. Um, and you can have this alone, which means you can find someone that's just a planner that walks you through this plan and does it for you. Or typically advisor, your advisor can do this for you as well, right? And these are kind of the different components that are in it. You identify what are your goals and those can be anything from, I wanna make sure I pay for my kid's wedding. I wanna make sure I pay for my kid's college, right? Um, your assets and liabilities, that's kind of your net worth statement, which we'll walk through on the next page. And cash flow, right? Understanding what's coming in and what's going out and does it need to be that way? Insurance planning, right? That's important. There's different policies and depending where you are in life, do you just need a quick term policy, right? To protect, if you were to pass, are all my expenses met? So I don't leave the burden on my partner, right? That's important. Or your kids, you don't want to leave burdens on other people. Well, maybe I just don't want to leave a burden on anyone. <laughs> and then last piece is monitor, monitoring it and optimizing it because things change. Okay, so here's a basic net worth statement, right? And here you just walk through and put all of your pieces on there. How much do I have in my 401k? How much does my partner have in their 401k? I lined it today just for one person. I didn't do a family. How much do I have in a Roth IRA? Maybe they were rollovers from a previous company, right? How much do I have in my account? Depending on assets in general, maybe you have it in a trust, right? Your term insurance. Your term insurance, I have it in here because it would flow to whoever you assign as your beneficiary, but I don't add it to your net worth because it hasn't really happened, right? And it's possible that you'll outlive a term policy, so it won't ever happen. And investments. Sometimes if we don't sit and like write all of these things down, what happens is we forget, right? Oh, I forgot years ago, my friend was opening a restaurant and I believe in it. I know they were great at organizing, cooking, everything was wonderful. So I lent them $40,000. That should be on your net worth statement. One, to keep track and two, because it should be a payable note to yourself. So, well, they should be able to pay you back. Um, your residential property, and then, of course, a deducting anything that you owe, which is your mortgage, loans, anything that you have, and then getting to your total net worth, yourself, your partner, and total. Okay, this is a case study that I thought would be interesting. So let me read it to you, and then I want you to think. So Leslie has 3 million in her 401k. When she started employment, they didn't offer the Roth option. So she's about to retire now and she's gonna roll this into a traditional IRA. She has 3 million in her trust account as well. So if Leslie's 70 and retiring, how much money does she have? Easy math would tell you 3 million in her 401k, 3 million in her trust account, she has six. Okay, so this is the piece where I'm talking about making sure that because of these distributions that have to be taken at age 72, does she really have that 3 million in her IRA? So the answer is no, right? That's the answer. No, she doesn't have that because she needs to pay Fed and state depending on where she is. So those are the pieces that you need to take into account and you shouldn't wait until you're 70 or 72 to be like, oh wait, I don't have this. I need to transfer that. I need to look for what to do. I don't have 6 million. And that's what I was accounting for in retirement because I wanted to live off of 4% of the income that it generates. That's what I was gonna live off of. And now I realize I don't have those dollars because now I'm, required to take that distribution, which will require me to pay taxes. So this is where you really need to build a plan. We can't just let things flow. So we did, right, financial planning, retirement planning, now estate planning. 
in estate planning, there's many documents you could create, but a few that I believe are really important are these five that are listed here, especially if you have kids. The will, the, the, the original purpose of the will is to make sure that you have a guardian assigned to your children. You don't want the court to decide this for you, right? So if anyone that is listening and does not have a will and you do have kids, please, please create that. The last thing you want is turmoil within your family if you and your spouse pass on where your children go. Then, and there's two ways to look at that. I'll get into a little bit more of the details between the will and then tying everything to the trust because a will does go through probate. That means it does go to the court system. Power of attorneys. We've all heard of power of attorneys, right? So there's a financial power of attorney that you can assign to someone, maybe for just a transaction if you need it. The healthcare power of attorney, right? If you're in the hospital and something drastic happens, who do you want making that decision? Some people are like, oh, I definitely would want the person who most loves me to make that decision because they're gonna make the best decision for me. This is where you have to think things through a little bit more. Are they gonna make the best decision for you? Are they gonna make the best decision for them? And by that, what I'm saying is there's people who assign, let's say their parent, right? Because they don't have a spouse anymore. So they assign their mother. I know my mother would never pull the plug. She would sit there and hope and pray for hours and days and years <laughs> to make sure nothing ever happened to me. So she's not going to pull the plug. Where if you ask me though, in my opinion, I might say no, if I'm a vegetable and the doctor has already stated there is nothing that can be done, maybe I don't want to be that burden on everyone. I don't want to be that person that everybody has to go visit, that everybody has to go, you know, be present for, even though I'm not there, right? And I know it's it's a personal decision, but having this document in place will make sure that your decision is what's being followed, not what someone else decides for you. And then the revocable living trust. So the revocable living trust is where you can place all your assets in and define when and who and where everything gets distributed. Typically, what we do is have the will, it's called a pour over will, and it pours into your revocable trust. That is how that one. That's how I have my estate set up. So in my will, I assigned guardians for my children. And then it's, so it's a, it's a easy one pager on my will. And then it says, and all my assets should pour into my trust. And then in my trust, there I can sit with my partner, with my husband, and we decide all the details of when, where, and how. Right? I have a few questions. Hold on. Uh, the question is when long term care becomes a medical deduction, taxes on distributions become less of an issue. I think that's just a statement that someone is giving, which is true, but it's still it's still an issue. And dependent on the total assets you have the larger the issue becomes. Okay, so if you're gonna do a quick checklist, what are the decisions you need to make? Who's gonna be your executor? Who's gonna be the guardian? And who's gonna be the beneficiaries, right? It's just getting yourself going to be able to have that plan for the future. And remember, if you just keep the will, that goes through probate. Some people prefer the will, it's easy, it's fast, and then you're done, and you don't have to go through all the details of, a, of creating a living trust or revocable trust. 
but then that means it goes through probate and probate just means it goes through the court systems and it's a delayed process. And let's say you pass and now let's say a husband passes because I'm sorry, men listening, <laughs> men tend to die before women do. So if we're left with this now and you're no longer there and I have to make a decision, but then I have to go through all of the other aspects of what do I do? How do I do it? It's If it's in a trust, it just flows a lot easier, over-prepared per se. And here, just to walk through the powers of attorney and the difference, this is why it is important to have a durable power of attorney if, if this is what you decide, because if you're ill, the other powers of attorney cease to function because you have to be in your right mind to allow a power of attorney unless it's a durable power of attorney. Here, if you have a medical emergency and you're mentally incapable of making a decision, the durable power of attorney does still work. So picking these people that are going to be your power of attorney is very important, right? You're putting on a big responsibility for them and it's a big decision for you to make. So it's something to sit down and think through either yourself or with your partner. The revocable living trust, right? So there's a grantor, the grantor is the creator of the trust. And typically, the, if it's a, this revocable living trust that we're talking about, the grantor is also the trustee. And the trustee is the one who makes the decisions on the trust. So you say, I, Vanessa, will open this trust and I will place a million dollars in this trust. That's me as a grantor. And then I say, but also I, as the grantor, assign Vanessa, myself, as the trustee. So as long as I'm alive, I make these decisions. Of course, there has to be a successor trustee because when I pass, then my husband can become the trustee if that's who I choose. And then after that, if he passes, then who becomes the trustee? I think sometimes going through this process, one of the pieces that become difficult to go through is the fact that we truly have to sit there and talk about, and then someone dies, and then if somebody else passes, and then if somebody else passes. So just talking about death over and over again can become very overwhelming. But if we sit and just take this as a document and say, it's just matter of fact, we will all pass at some point. So let's just make sure we have a plan in place for our loved ones that are still around. I know it's difficult, because I remember sitting with my attorney and assigning my sister, my younger sister, and then him saying, oh, well, when she passes, and then I was like, okay, then I'll put this person, and then I'll put this person, and then my other sister. And it was just sad to think of these thoughts, but we have to get over it. It's just pieces that happen, right? Just move on to the next one. Spouses both trustees and not successor trustees. You can do that. So you can have a co-trustee. So let's say if I'm the grantor, I, Vanessa, I'm the grantor, you can have co-trustees and not as a successor trustees. Yes, you can do that. The only thing is then, then you have to make decisions together for that trust, right? If it's a family, there's two different types of trust. I can have my trust, my husband can have his trust. And then we can have a family trust if that's the way we decide. Or if the family decides, no, I don't want to have my own and his own. I want to have a family trust. Then yes, one could be the grantor. You can have the other be the trustee. So it just depends on the family dynamics and how you choose to do so. Okay, now we're at the final phase, which is conveying wealth, right? What can we do with money? Well, it has to go, taxes is part of this, but <laughs> you can spend it, you can gift it, you can inherit, or you can donate it. Those are the pieces that we're gonna talk about. Before we get into all of those pieces, these are some things that you need to think about that can happen in the future 
that it'd be nice to be a little more in tune with, right? There could be health concerns that you didn't think about, right? You don't write those things in that maybe I had an accident, maybe I fell down the stairs, maybe, right? So there's health concerns that are unexpected. That's an additional cost. So if in your mind you said, okay, as long as I have X dollars, a million, two million dollars set for my retirement plan because I was going to do these five things you need to take into account how about health concerns, obviously volatility in the market, rising healthcare costs, um, longevity. We talked about that earlier. We're just living a little longer now, which means that if we thought we'd, we were 80 or 70 and we had 25 years, now it might be 35 years right? So that means your dollars need to be extended. So just having those things in place. And if you do have your estate plan, the changes that can happen in the law, which we'll talk about one of those that is due to sunset in 20, the end of 2025. So December 31st of 2025, if no changes are made, we'll get into that one in a minute. So spending. With spending, it's now you got to get organized, right? When you retire, the sense of knowing that your portfolio is what's going to supply that income. I'm, I love to work, right? So I love to know that I have income coming in from what I'm, I'm, I'm deriving it, right? I'm building that income. Once you're retired, it's from that portfolio. That change in life is so drastic, right? It's not, now you have to pull money from the portfolio to go into your checking account. So just being prepared for that change. And many people think, oh, now I'm retired. I'm for sure going to spend less. That is not how it works, by the way. Statistics show that you retire today and your expenses go up before they come down and then flat because you have time on your hands. Before you were working, your spouse was working. Now you're both retired. So you're like, well, if we have nothing to do. Let's travel to go see the kids. Let's travel to go see the grandkids. Let's travel for fun, right? Let's go out to dinner. So all of these expenses add up. And that's kind of the plan to build around that when you retire, you'll need a little more in the beginning until you embrace this retirement life. Okay, there is another question. So it says, with a trust, what is the what is best for handling? For an example, everyday checking account pay on death. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking, but if this this is what I'm getting from this question. So does your everyday checking account should that be in your trust? So the answer is yes. Everything should be in your trust name, in your trust name. That's all it is, right? So you have your trust document. It's a document. Don't go off and put it in a drawer and lock that drawer and said, yep, I'm set, I'm done. That is not what you should do, but that is what 90% of people do. Because of what we were talking about, the laws changing, life changing, there's amendments you need to make to that trust. So I would sit with families all the time and I would tell them, well, that trustee, has passed. So you need to pick someone else because what's going to happen when, when both of you pass? That person's not existent. So then it's going to go where, right? Did you even set a provision in your trust that says what happens if this person is gone? So that's why it's important to double check it. And like an everyday checking account, because if you do pass, everything is already in that. So nobody has to worry about going from bank to bank saying, Oh, Vanessa had an account here. Um, what do I do with it? Oh, well, sorry. If it's over a certain dollar amount, every state is different. Illinois, I think is $100,000. Um, if it's over this dollar amount, then it has to go through probate. You don't want that. If the purpose of the person creating the trust, their main goal was to avoid probate. And now what we did was leave a few counts out, leave a property somewhere with just in 
sole name, right? Justin Vanessa Martinez. That's the name, of, uh, that's the title on that property. Or now it's become very common with companies trying to keep employees that they add all these additional benefits. And one of those benefits is stock options, right? So now you hold stock. First thing you do is, because it's not very normal for everyone to have a trust, is the company says, okay, where do you want it assigned to? And you're like, yeah, it's mine. Put it in my name. Those are the moments where you got to be like, wait, I have a trust. Don't put it in my name. Put it in my trust name, right? Because then you're protecting that. No matter what happens, no matter if you move to another company, whatever you do, that stock now is in trust and your trust decides what happens with everything in it according to your wishes. So that's very, very important. And this piece is, is, is funny. It's sometimes we get so caught up in, do I have enough? Am I okay? That you don't spend. And that's not the purpose, right? You worked really hard. It's just planning these pieces that make it safe for you to say, yeah, I do want to have that house on the lake. And now I'm on the lake. I do want that boat. Okay, let's just build a plan. Let's just build that plan that will make sure you are okay and you will continue to be okay. Okay, gifting during lifetime. This is one of my favorites because why not share that happiness with your family, right? So families in the past, it was I pass, then I inherit, then you have the money. That's it. And then you figure it out when you're there, right? I worked hard, I built this for you, and now I'm giving it to you once I'm gone. But many families, which is exciting, have started to embrace the of let's gift today because we can and we know that we'll be okay even if we gift to you and in some cases it's actually an advantage to gift now because you're over the amount of money that you can have without paying about 45 percent taxes on it and then you get to have joy in the experiences together that's why you could see here you know a little heart with a little car on it because you're traveling together. Those experiences are wonderful. As the advisor, I don't want to be the one sitting at the table sharing this wealth with your family for the first time. Uh, it's wonderful to have this sense of communication and keeping it safe to talk about money and how it was created, right? It's one of the rules is it says after the third generation of passing on wealth, the wealth is lost. But then if we think why, it's one main reason, communication. We don't communicate with our family members about it because money was such a taboo topic that you don't talk about it. It's bad. If I share with my kids how much money we have, then they're going to be lazy. They're not going to go to work. They're not going to go to school. They're not going to do this. They're not going to do that. I mean, that's a decision that they're going to make upon themselves. It's your job as a parent to pass on those values, right? And hope <laughs> that they listen as much as we try to, you know, instill in them these, these values and these, let's call them rules, right? It is, they're their own human. So we can't change that, but we can definitely change the, this new sense of legacy, right? That we're passing on to our kids. Can savings or checking accounts avoid probate if it has a pay on death designation? Yes, it can. So it's the pay on death, transfer on TOD, POD. Yes, if you have that, you do avoid probate. So that's another way, right? So you don't have a trust and you're not ready to create one. That is the best option, right? So for retirement accounts, you just assign a beneficiary. And for individual accounts like this checking and saving, you add a transfer on death or payable on death. Okay, so these were the rules that I was talking about earlier. So lifetime exemptions. As of 2022, it's 12.06 million per person that you can have without having that big tax burden but this is due to sunset in January of 2026, cut in half. So if your 
family's assets, let's say between you and your partner is over the 12 million mark. These are the planning pieces that you need to go about thinking now, what can you do? And there's many, many options of what you can do. And this is the gifting during lifetime piece. So as of 2022, it's 16,000 per person that you can gift. And it's an annual gift exclusion, right? You don't pay taxes. The recipient doesn't pay taxes. It's just a gift. You can also, so if your family has above that in wealth, they can do paying tuition and medical bills, and that doesn't count for that 16. So you have another space where you can gift. And this is just general, right? So inheriting your wealth, of course you want to do so because you love your family or you love causes, what, whoever you're inheriting to. Um, there's just additional benefits as well on how much more you can give them if you plan in advance. Uh, and then before deciding on how much to inherit, you have to consider aspects like your income needs and expenses. That was that other piece that we talked about, right? That what else is going to happen? What are those other concerns? Healthcare costs rising or just something happening to you that was unexpected. And donating. Of course, this is a personal decision. Right? Is there an organization that you believe in and that you know helps others? And maybe one of your values that was instilled with your family, right? And just your family legacy passing on to you is to be generous, to share with others, right? Not just your immediate family, but others. So there's multiple ways that you can donate your will and still take advantage of other advantages like appreciated securities, right? So if you have a holding that is very, very, uh, has a large gain, you can gift that so that way you don't have to take on the burden of the tax consequence of that holding. So these are very particular details. We'd have to get into them with every single person, you know, to be exact on the advice given. Um, look for help. Right, there's multiple options. Um, and definitely having an advisor that walks you through the steps and you know aligns that and does all this organizational piece that we talked about today. It's so important to have someone help and know that there's multiple fee structures out there. So if you're in the creating wealth and you and you say, Okay, well, I don't want to pay or I don't have the money to pay someone X amount of dollars, well. There's hourly rates, there's flat rates, there's fee only. Assets under management is the standard, but it depends on the situation you're in. And what I just want to share is that there's multiple ways, different types of advisors out there that can help. And another piece is that talking about wealth, right? Because one of the biggest pieces in finding that true wealth is making sure you talk about it to our parents and to our kids. And sometimes it's difficult. And I've had family members ask me, right? When I have the kids that come to me that are 40 and 50, these are the kids. And they're like, you know, I try to talk to my parents, but they don't want to talk about it. They tell me to mind my business or they tell me to stay out of it. One of the tips that I tell them is, okay, so why don't you just ask for advice, right? Why don't you go to your parents and say, hey, I'm building my estate plan with my family and I'd want some advice. How do you do it? What do you do? Right? Because you should want advice. And if it's not coming from another place, why not go? If they've already done it, right? Why reinvent the wheel? Mom, dad, what do you do? Right? Help us build this plan for our future and for our kids. So that is one of the most important pieces of making sure you have this communication. And if you're the parents, if you're the matriarch and patriarch of the family, make sure you talk things through before you sit with your family, right? I call it kind of like the pre-family meeting. You and your spouse have to sit and talk things through because questions will come up. What are you okay with addressing? What are you not okay with addressing? Um, 
and what can you prepare for that might come up in conversation. So I talked quite a bit. <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here and it's truly a big step. It's a Saturday, right? You guys could be doing absolutely anything else, but you're really sitting here taking the time to learn more about what you can do to build a better legacy for your family. So take that moment, be proud of yourself for being here and thank you for listening. <laughs>